Um, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to take stock um, of the ways in which the law uh, on treaty interpretation has in evolved perhaps um, ever since the adoption of the Vienna Convention. And we're also going to look um, at the number of challenges that we are facing um, in that respect. I'm very happy to be chairing a, a panel with, um, with indeed excellent, um, excellent specialists on the topic, um, starting with Irina Buga, who will not be joining us live, uh, but we will soon start a recording of her presentation. Um, Irina is an attorney at De Brouw, which is a, a, a law firm here in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, um, and she specializes in international investment, commercial arbitration, acted as a counsel in arbitration proceedings um, and wrote a lot on international law and, and dispute settlements, including a nice book, 2018, uh, published by OUP. Secondly, um, Kirsten Schmallenbach, who, who is actually here. Um, hi, Kirsten, welcome uh, to Groningen, uh, albeit virtually. Professor of international law um, and European Union law, which I find an excellent combination still, at the University of, uh, of Salzburg. Uh, published widely on, on international institutional law, the law of treaties, international procedural law, international dispute settlement, and even the external relations of the, uh, of the European Union. And Kirsten is also a valued member of the editorial board of our international organizations law review. Um, so I've mentioned that journal at least once now. Um, finally, um, uh, Panos, who does not need an, any introduction, Panos Mercuris, Professor of Interpretation and Dispute Settlement um, here in Groningen um, at the Department of Transboundary Legal Studies, uh, and of course our host of today, um, but now as a participant in this, um, in this panel. So we're starting with uh, Irina's paper, um, which is a paper about the treaty impact on subsequent customary international law, um, as she says, pushing the boundaries of the rules of inter interpretation. Um, it's really about the interpretation of the limits of the rule of interpretation um, in relation to the process of, uh, of subsequent practice um, as a source of, of, of treaty modification. Um, so Soterios, uh, perhaps you can... Some very strange to thank somebody um, at, at distance and not only a distance even on a recording um, but it's good for Irina to know at least that we are recording also this whole panel um, so any questions you may have uh, can and will be seen by her and of course it's a bit strange to ask questions but there, there, I'm, I'm sure there will be others also able to, um, to answer those questions. Um, Perhaps um, one thing that comes to mind if I just kick off uh, perhaps um, the discussion that we might have is something that Irina is not, not really focusing on, not mentioning too much, but which has been addressed in, in, in the literature. And that is, of course, the uh, democratic legitimacy um, of, of treaties that um, are being modified uh, through what she calls customary modification. Um, obviously, it's the case, um, and that has been addressed, of course, um, extensively also in the literature. Um, that, that at least, even if parties agree and consent to new rules uh, being interpreted in a different way, at least, um, then we still have may have national parliaments uh, having a problem with that, um, simply claiming this is what we not what we didn't sign up for uh, in the beginning. Um, we concluded a treaty, we approved the ratification of a treaty by our government. Uh, but after 10 or more years, uh, it suddenly seems to be something completely different. So that is an issue that is perhaps very closely related also to, um, to this whole process. But that was just to kick off the discussion. I'm looking at everyone to see if there's anything else that you um, want to raise in connection to um, what Irina presented. In the meantime, perhaps, yes, the other participants, Panos. Yeah, and, and this is uh, for, for posterity purposes for for Irina's uh, benefits, and also if, if if she decides to to respond, it would be nice to also because she she touched upon thirty one three C and the connection with subsequent agreements and practice, and also with uh, with customary international law. Uh, it would be nice to to try and, and unravel this. Uh, a little bit, also with respect to volumes of interpretation, because we tend to categorize it either under ordinary meaning, 313C, somewhere else, pretty much uh, everywhere. Um, so it would be nice to, to, uh, to have a little bit of more uh, analysis and discussion on this particular topic. Thank you very much. Anyone else at this moment wants to jump in? <laughs> 
nothing in the um, Q and A box yet. If that is not the case, I propose that you uh, continue thinking about this presentation and we move towards uh, Kirsten's um, uh, presentation. Um, and many of those um, uh, issues will return in any case. Uh, so Kirsten's paper um, is entitled The Impact of Rules and Acts uh, of International Organizations uh, on the Interpretation of Treaties. So what she will do, um, hopefully, let's see, um, examine the role of decisions adopted by international organizations uh, on the interpretation of treaties. And, and then she will take a particular good look at those treaties concluded between member states of those international organizations, uh, the subject matter of which falls, in fact, uh, within the functions of the, um, of the organization. So it's basically about the significance of decisions of international organizations for the interpretation of, um, of, of treaties. Um, and it's with much pleasure, Kirsten, that I uh, hand over the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, for the kind introduction. I have to admit uh, all the topics you mentioned I'm interested in. The most important is being on board of the International Organizations Law Report a review, sorry, and that is again camouflaged advertisement here. So for uh, the journal. And thank you for inviting me to this interesting um, and very, you know, thought provoking workshop. I, I'm quite unhappy that I couldn't uh, join earlier. So with regard to my topic, as um, Randers already said, that I'm very much interested in international organizations. And when I proposed this topic, I really wanted to link international organizations with interpretation. Um, I have to admit, I mean, it will be a little bit different as uh, it was just announced, but nevertheless. So let me start with um, the reason why I picked the topic. So the role of inter international organization as normative actors in international law is an increasingly popular topic in international scholarship. And partly because international bodies such as the IOC, but also international organizations themselves tend to marginalize their role in international lawmaking processes. Now, closely related to the issue of lawmaking is a question of whether IOs, acts, and decisions are relevant factors in the interpretation of treaties to which there are not themselves parties. So I, I limited that to this uh, situation. My, further considerations. So by way of a caveat, uh, we will only undertake a 20 minute whirlwind tour through my topic. And admittedly, my considerations are still work in progress, which makes your input in the subsequent dis uh, discussion especially valuable. I will divide my presentation into three parts. Part one will take a brief look at the range of IO acts and decisions which may have relevance in the context of treaty interpretation. Part two will explore the potential these acts may have, at least at a theoretical level, within the canon of interpretation methods. Then the third and final part will highlight case law in which various acts of international organizations have found their way into the interpretative work of international courts and tribunals. It is worth noting at this point that the decisions of international organizations appear rather sporadically in the interpretative work of international judicial bodies. However, this does not necessarily mean that such bodies refuse to consider such decisions as a matter of principle. Not every treaty that requires interpretation gives rise to the need to consider extrinsic material. As such, the case law analyzed will primarily answer the question of how decisions of international organization are methodologically incorporated into the rules of treaty interpretation. When talking about IO acts and decisions, the focus often falls on UN Security Council or General Assembly resolutions. Without questioning their importance to the context treaty interpretation, it is obvious that the majority of international organizations exist in a much more diverse legal landscape. IOs 
adopt a wide, uh, a wide variety of international instruments with external normative value. Indeed, most of them are non-legally binding. These non-legally binding instruments can set technical standards, identify best practice and principles, provide explanations and guidelines for implementation, and present model treaties or laws. Non-binding instruments aim to either provide incentives for the addressee to behave in a certain way or to facilitate the proper implementation of other normative instruments, for example, human rights treaties or environmental treaties. Whatever the case may be, these I.O. decisions are often labeled as soft law instruments and can find their way as such into the interpretation efforts. Less common are prescriptive instruments, which have a legally binding effect on their addressees, but there, there are some. Security Council resolutions clear, that's clear, ICAO standards, ITU regulations, WHO regulations, and regulations of the CBET authority, to name a few. My research focuses on intergovernmental organization with international legal personality, IOs, as I abbreviate them. However, there is another category of actors that not class as IOs, but whose decision nevertheless have considerable influence on the interpretation of treaties. And these are treaty bodies, which are established by a treaty and tasked with monitoring the compliance with the relevant treaty. And in doing so, necessarily interpret the treaty. Treaty bodies can be composed of state parties, so-called COPs, or groups of independent experts, for example, the various committees of universal human rights treaties. The written contribution, which hopefully will come, will include uh, these treaty expert bodies in my overall research design in order to find out, among other things, whether their decision have a different interpretative value than the decisions of international organizations. This brings me to the second part of my presentation, which is devoted to the possible contributions of IO decisions to treaty interpretation and their possible place within the traditional set of interpretation rules. And I have to say here that after really looking into case law, I do fear I can't identify any evolution in treaty interpretation. The opposite is clear, only to just put that uh, in front of my, uh, uh, what I uh, want to discuss next. So let's start with the obvious, uh, the determination of the ordinary meaning of terms used by the treaty, Article 31, Paragraph 1, or the customary equivalent. This termination always requires a certain contextual understanding of the term in question, and this context can often be clearly perceived by the language repeatedly used by international organizations. For example, the term responsibility in the context of sovereignty. The WTO appellate body interpreted the term exhaustible natural resources in Article 20, GUT, by referring inter alia to a related consideration by the World Commission for Environment and Development. But, and that is telling, it did so only in a footnote in the Appellate Report. That said, international environmental law is blessed with this very, you know, lot of active, with a very active IO community, and the UNEP is a good example for that, whose Cairo guidelines on the transport of hazardous waste helps us to understand the obligation of environmental sound management under the Basel Convention, for example. A uh, purposive, uh, purposive interpretation envisaged in Article 31, Paragraph 1 requires the identification of the object and purpose of the treaty. Um, it's talents, well, that's clear. Especially when a treaty has been institutionally launched within an organization, it seems obvious that there is a need to identify and specify the object and purpose of that treaty by referring to the rationale elaborated in the decisions of the IO, which then triggers the treaty making process. 
Again, this can only be one of many indicators for a specific treaty purpose. And in addition, these decisions may be considered a supplementary means of interpretation as they are part of the double preparatoire of the given treaty, Article 32. In the area of context interpretation, and I refer here to Article 31, Paragraph 2, IO acts and decisions are of less relevance because this context is specifically created by the parties in connection with the conclusion of their treaty. IO acts and decisions are first and foremost extraneous material that falls at least at first sight more comfortably under Article 31, Paragraph 3. That said, the WTO appellate body considered the harmonized system of tariff nomenclature as an agreement relating to the WTO agreement pursuant to Article 31, Paragraph 2, Hit A. This harmonized system is developed and maintained by the World Custom Organization, an international organization. That is a little bit of an unusual case, I have to admit. It's a chicken cuts case. As already mentioned, IO acts and decisions are better suited to contribute to extrinsic uh, to the extrinsic context uh, um, of a treaty pursuant to paragraph three of Article 31. Subsequent practice of organs of IOs in the application of their constituent instrument is especially relevant and recognized in the context of the interpretation of the constituent instrument. Paragraph 3, lit B of Article 31. There are plenty uh, of examples where the ICJ accepted that practice of I, uh, UN organs gave a certain spin to provisions of the UN Charter, most famously in the certain expense uh, opinion and the wall opinion. Even the ILC, which with its obvious reluctance to allow IO into the legal sphere, where, which are, is traditionally reserved for states, seem to have blinked in its conclusion, 12 paragraph 3, in the 2018 draft conclusion on subsequent agreements and subsequent practice. This conclusion states that, and I quote, the practice of an international organization in the application of its constituent instrument may contribute to the interpretation of that agreement, uh, that instrument when applying Article 31 and Article 32. End of quote. That is carefully phrased, but clear enough. Whether IO acts and decision can be classified as subsequent agreements between parties, Article 3, uh, paragraph 3, lit A of Article uh, 31, is open to debate. However, what can happen is that states can agree to an instrument produced by an international organization. That is the case with the OECD arrangement and sector understanding, which gained interpretative importance under various WTO agreements. IO acts and decisions are not only extrinsic and extraneous material in relation to the treaty that needs interpreting, but they are part of today's international corpus jus communis, according to my view. As such, it appears to be logical to consider them under Article 31, Paragraph 3, Lit C, and under the principle of system systemic integration. We will hear later more about that principle. However, two major obstacles exist to consider them in this manner. First, if the relevant rules to which Lit C refers have to be legally binding, many IO acts fall outside of the scope of systemic integration. If they have not crystallized into customer international law, these decisions. Second, if the act of an IO must be binding to all parties to the treaty in order to be considered an extrinsic corpus juris, the interpretation method is less suitable for universal treaties. This problem obviously does not arise with uh, Security Council resolutions under Chapter 7, 
clearly be binding to all UN member states. The European Court of Human Rights referred to them in the decision in the judgment Louis de of 1995 by explicitly considering the strong worded resolution as relevant rules of international law applicable in the relation between the parties. That said, Security Council resolutions concern individual situation and thus are not, strictly speaking, rules of general application. And therefore, the European Court of Human Rights did not use the Security Council resolution to interpret the language of the Human Rights Convention, but to understand the facts of the case, that is, the non-recognition of Northern Cyprus as a state in the context of the application of the human rights of property. My preceding consideration would have placed the acts and decisions of IOs within the scope of Article 31 and the customary equivalent. References to international jurisprudence have served mainly for illustrative purposes. However, the significance of IO acts and decisions in the context of treaty interpretation can be also evaluated from the perspective of international case law. This allows us to understand whether IO acts are considered as only supplementary means of treaty interpretation, so with less no, you know, normative value. Mm -hmm. Due to time constraints, I will only highlight a few examples of international case law, which I considered interesting for my topic. Well, a famous example of integrating IO decisions into treaty interpretation is the ICJ whaling case. With regard to the object and purpose of the International Convention on the Regulation of Whaling, the court observed that the recommendations of the International Whaling Commission, IWC, may put an emphasis on one or more objectives pursuant to the convention. However, and that is important, these recommendations cannot alter the convention's objective and purpose, according to the court. That said, the guidelines and resolutions of the IWC help the court to interpret Article 8 of the convention in relation to its object and purpose. This time, the ICJ did not place its consideration within the framework of Article 31. At a later state, stage, when interpreting the phrase for the purpose of scientific research in Article 8, the court firmly put IWC resolutions in their place. If the resolutions are not approved by consensus, they cannot be regarded as subsequent agreements or subsequent practice within the meaning of Article 31 paragraph 3, 8, and B, A and B. That did not hinder the court from taking recommendations into account when specifying Japan's obligation under this Article 8, because, and I quote the court, court, Japan is obliged to give due regard to the recommendations. In its first advisory opinion of 2011, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea interpreted the nodular and sulfide regulation adopted by the CBET authority, that is an international organization as well. It applied the rules of Article 31 to this regulation, so to an act of an international organization. The tribunal justified this approach by pointing at the similarities between the treaty and this regulation, which is legally binding. Further on, the tribunal used the regulation to better understand UNCLOS provisions because they were either identical or deviate, this time without any reference to Article 31. That said, the true relevance of the regulation for the advisory opinion was that they are a source of obligation in their own rights. Uh, I move on to WTO panel. Decision. The WTO panel and appellate body reports are an invaluable source of treaty interpretation in this presentation's context, given their significance um, uh, with regard to the incorporation of IOX decision for the purpose of interpretation 
In her 2012 book on international organization in WTO dispute settlement, Marina Voltea extensively examines the role of IO decisions in the interpretation efforts of the WTO dispute settlement mechanism. And I really enjoyed reading that book. Very, very interesting how she approached the problem. So in her conclusion, but also in my analysis of the newer material, we found that the, res the, the result is both uplif uplifting and sobering. WTO dispute settlement bodies use the decision of international organizations as a means for interpretation on a fairly regular basis, but most often they're not merely as a supplementary means that confirms a result already found elsewhere. To a great extent, IO's decisions are used to support textual and contextual interpretation. However, the panels and the appellate body do not consider decisions of international organizations as relevant rules of international law, which could provide extrinsic context to the WTO agreement. And that is disappointing from the perspective of the Corpus Juris Communis. I've already mentioned the reference of the European Court of Human Rights to Security Council resolutions. With regard to the principle of systemic integration, it is noteworthy that in the 2010 Tanasa case, the court stated that, and I quote, it must take into account relevant international instruments and reports, and in particular, those of other Council of Europe organs. However, this remark concerned the broader context of Moldavia's international obligations and not the interpretation of human rights provisions. Generally speaking, the European Court of Human Rights attaches little importance to extraneous interpretation material provided by any international organizations. Another case worth considering with regard to IO decisions as part of the international corpus Jus communis is the PCA Iron Rhine Railway case of 2005. In this case, this case is significant in several respects. Firstly, the European Union law is classified as a relevant rule under Article 31, Paragraph 3, Lit C. However, one has to keep in mind that the arbitration agreement explicitly allowed the application of EU law as part of international law. Secondly, the tribunal raised the issue of environmental soft law in the context of paragraph 3, lit C, although without offering a solution with regard to the, to the legally non-binding material and their purpose in the context of interpretation. The tribunal then subsequently only spoke of environmental norms, uh, which were relevant for the interpretation of the Treaty of Separation between Belgium and the Netherlands. And finally, I would like to address, and that is my last uh, case study, the ECJ case law. And here the case of Austria versus Germany, which concerns the interpretation of the double taxation agreement, which was submitted by these two member states to the court under a special agreement, Article 270, three of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. The reason why this case is interesting for us is the OECD Model Convention on Income and on Capital, on the basis of which the relevant provision of the double taxation agreement was worded. Advocate General Mengosi explicitly referred to paragraph 3, lit C, of Article 31 in order to justify his reliance on the OECD model convention and its commentaries. He pointed out that irrespective of what the value of the OECD commentaries is in international law, Germany and Austria has agreed in the double taxation agreement to consider those commentaries as being one of the sources for the rule of interpretation. Admittedly, the party's prior agreement on the relevance of the commentary put this case into a special category. Nevertheless, it is intriguing that the European Court of Justice 
later in the judgment entirely ignores this OECD model convention, despite the court's mentioning of the importance of the relevant rules of international law for treaty interpretation. With this, I come to my conclusion. The foregoing consideration on international case law are by far not exhaustive. Nevertheless, some primary remarks or results can be identified. Basically, it is obvious that IO acts and decisions do not play a central role within the framework of treaty interpretation, with the WTO jurisprudence being a notable exception in this respect. International courts seem to have issues with IO decisions on several levels, namely considering them somewhat disconnected from the consent of the parties to the treaty that requires interpretation. And this consent remains central for context interpretation. From the consent perspective, there appears to be a legitimacy deficit attached to IO decisions. However, as far as the modern understanding of a treaty text is concerned, reference to IO acts certainly add legitimacy to textual interpretation. That said, even within the context of textual interpretation, IO's acts and decisions merely have a supporting role in treaty interpretation and thus fall within the scope of Article 32. They have less interpretative value than other instruments. Moreover, IO acts and decisions are not a natural part of the relevant rules of international law. That is my conclusion. This view is in line with what I said at the beginning of my presentation. As long as IOs are dismissed as not being full-fledged international lawmakers, their decision will not be considered as part of the system of international law, unless, of course, they have crystallized into customary international law and general principles of international law, which received, again, critical mass of support by a state concept. And with that, I would like to close my presentation. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Kirsten, for this uh, very rich uh, presentation on an interesting topic. Decisions of, uh, of international organizations uh, and the role of those decisions in, in treaty interpretation. Um, there's a number of questions uh, coming up, um, of course, and some of them are related directly to your, um, to your uh, presentation. I mean, it's, it, it remains interesting to see that, as you also indicate, this seems to be a sort of separate section in international law all the time. Um, and it's very nice that you bring it together with, um, with international treaty law in a way. And in a way that is strange because there are more international organizations than there are states. Um, uh, and so in that sense, they sh their voice should, should be heard. And I, I immediately uh, also would like to add that I always find a sort of unease when I, I hear people talk about decisions of international organizations as agreements. Between, uh, between the member states, right? I think we would probably uh, quite soon agree um, on the fact that, that those are indeed decisions taken by a body that indeed was created by states, but um, is a separate international legal person. Um, so the, the whole idea of, of agreements um, um, as underlying EU uh, IO decisions is, is, is a bit strange. Um, your last remarks were also interesting um, in, in that sense um, to say that the problem uh, for international organizations also to contribute, for instance, to, to customary law is, is of course, a, another line in the literature that you have seen coming up, that we have seen coming up over the past few years. Um, to what extent can international organizations as such at all contribute to, uh, to customary law? Uh, it's, it's not state practice that we're looking at. And of course, then it would be easy if you look at the practice of states acting in international organizations, then it would be much easier. But what about the acts of the international organizations themselves? Can they act as practice, country organization practice, contributing to the um, development or creation of, of customary law? But I'm, I'm talking too too long um, because I want to go to um, to the um, to the questions, um, and and some of them are appearing already in the um, 
in the Q&A box. Um, let me, I, I'm, I'm sure that you, can you see them as well, Kristen? Because I'm going to summarize them. So it would be good for you uh, perhaps also to read the, um, to read them yourself. Um, and I see um, Hélène uh, also raising her. You want to start? Um, Yes, very briefly, because I also react to what you've said. What is interesting there is uh, when you say, okay, people should accept that decisions of international organizations are decisions of a body and not agreement between uh, uh, member states. But this is precisely an ambiguity that you, you find in WTO law, and it is uh, closely related to a denial about the existence of secondary law in WTO law. And so if you accept the idea of secondary law, then you accept the existence of decisions made by the body of the organization. But when you deny this idea of secondary law, then your legal analysis of decisions made by a body are in fact that this is a collective uh, agreement between the members. And uh, this goes very well with the mantra or an ideology which prevails in the organization that it is the member driven organization, you know. So you have all this uh, discourse around the organization which conditions the approach. And uh, indeed, I agree with all what Kirsten said. I mean, it, it gives a great biases uh, in the interpretation because instead of, of uh, going for secondary law as a tool for interpretation, you go for a subsequent agreement agreement, for example, and this uh, gives a, a different term uh, to the way in which you approach um, interpretation. So I just wanted to, to, to show the line of reasoning which can, which can uh, lead to this uh, type of, of, uh, of situation, whether we like it or not, and whether it, it goes well with our logic or, or, uh, or uh, not. So I just wanted to stress this, this aspect because uh, we could see this in several cases, like the Tuna case, for example. And, and uh, indeed, I was puzzled by the way things were interpreted, but there you can see a very differential or to a certain extent, a differential uh, judge uh, preferring to opt for this qualification of a subsequent agreement instead of jumping into the debate of the possible existence of secondary law. So it can be also internal to the organization. And maybe I would add a question to Kirsten as I have the floor, which is related to the way the panel used the, the General Assembly resolutions in the case on uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia, and in relation to, to the interpretation of uh, security uh, exceptions. And so there it was uh, really interesting to see how the panel relied on the, on the fact that the General Assembly had assessed and qualified the situation and uh, was felt secure to rely on this uh, qualification, whereas in other instances, you could, could see uh, uh, adjudicatory bodies distancing themselves from assessment by political uh, bodies. Thank you. Thank you for giving the floor, no, giving thank, the thank floor you. as a priority. <laughs> thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, this is very helpful. And also pointing out that there is a difference between international organizations, obviously, and the WTO example is very illustrative in that respect. Thinking about another international organization, the European Union, nobody would think of regulations or directives as agreements between the member states, right? Whereas in the OSCE, probably everybody would get nervous if you would talk about decisions. Um, so let me then turn to the, uh, the, the, the questions that should now indeed be uh, visible to, to everyone. Um, Audrey, um, do you distinguish between different instruments of an IO? Uh, question to Kirsten, um, e.g. in international human rights law, UN special reports, treaty bodies, decisions under communications procedure, different types. Um, how do you assess their degree of authoritativeness? Um, Referring back to something that uh, Glider Hernandez uh, mentioned this morning, and you were not yet here, so that is difficult for you to answer, perhaps. Uh, another question, I'm, I'm just collecting a few so you can react um, perhaps to all of them together. Um, Anna, many thanks for your presentation. You mentioned that often the reference to IOX is made in the footnotes of a judgment or decision report rather than in the main analysis. My understanding is that these footnotes more often than not do not specify the legal basis for such reference or explain how they become relevant. This is especially the evidence in the WTO panel and AB reports. How would you classify or ca characterize these vague references in footnotes? Are these acts used by a means of interpretation? Something else? 
Um, given that there are no immediate other questions, Kirsten, perhaps you can also referring to um, to Elen's point and perhaps pick up these two things as well. Yeah, you know, it's always interesting to have these these many, you know, the uh, uh, technology. Let me put it this way: technology. So I would like to start with Audrey's uh, uh, question: whether I distinguish between different instruments. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, I do, and I, I want to do it uh, later. So in my presentation, I really wanted to focus on these, you know, traditional IOs, intergovernmental organization, and that kicked out a lot of um, uh, treaty bodies, uh, which interpret um, human rights treaties. I, so uh, indeed, but you refer also to UN organs, which interpret um, um, which interpret uh, uh, the um, uh, human rights treaties. Now, the, the point here, the point I want to make is, is uh, first of all, I do think that treaty bodies of human rights treaties, they might have a special position when it comes to the, the value of their interpretation effort. And for example, their general comments, even though if you look into the ICJ case law, you will see that the ICJ push them into Article 32. So, you know, we do not want to have fragmentation by different bodies who interpret the same uh, instrument and therefore, you know, we are not bound by it. We, we look at it, we take it seriously, but, you know, it is kind of a, a supplementary uh, interpretation. That was my, uh, um, you know, my uh, first thought when I read, for example, the Diallo case. Now, um, with regard to UN organs, we interpret uh, the, for example, Human Rights Council, to, uh, which interprets um, human rights treaties. I was so interested to see whether this interpretation effort are uh, taken up by international courts and tribunals, couldn't find anything. But I'm not done with my research because literally, I mean, you know, there is a lot of material out there. Um, but it appears to be that the, the natural inclination is to go to the treaty body who has the competence to, to just interpret the specific treaty and not to the, the UN organ. Well, with regard to the degree or, or, or sort of this, uh, I don't know exactly what has been discussed in the morning, um, but I, I, you know, when I read the cases where courts, you know, try to, to um, uh, integrate decisions of IOs into their interpretation of a treaty. I, I, I had the feeling from a, a subject matter point of view, the authority of these uh, decisions were not in doubt. It was this old fashioned formal approach that these decisions are disconnected to consent. So it is not authority, it's form, uh, which uh, uh, is the crucial element which sets you know, uh, them apart, international apart from uh, subsequent agreements made by state, for example. Um, I would now like to move on if that clarifies, uh, Audrey, what uh, you ask, and if not, I apologize, and uh, move on to Anna. Um, so, yeah, the footnote, that is an interesting, you know, the, the footnote gave, gave me a break. I mean, I thought, you know, that is a, a very important piece of information. So I really felt insulted as, you know, what someone who is very interested in international organizations that uh, their very in a decision of an international organization which has value, normative value, is hidden away in a footnote. But I might to misunderstand the working technique of WTO panels. So it could be that uh, they do not want to distract, you know, by, you know, loading too much information into the text, want to distract the reader or the, the parties to the dispute, and therefore that belonged to, um, into the footnote. However, it tells us something. Again, it is, uh, you know, these, these the, the panel made already its decision on the textual interpretation, and that was, clearly expressed in the text, whereas the, the secondary means, you know, which supports 
what the WTO panel said was then in the footnote. So Article 32 all over again. So in reality, so sometimes by, uh, you have to, even though the WTO uh, treat, uh, dispute settlement bodies, use Article 31 to explain the, uh, the function of IO decisions within the treat, uh, interpretation effort, but in reality, they class them as Article 32 material. So that is my opinion on, on footnotes. And I have here a third question. André said, I think you haven't read that. How would you place decisions of organs of international organization possibly adopted by the majority board taking? Yeah, well, I, that is a question whether I think it would be appropriate to integrate to 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 integrate the majority decisions taking international organizations into more forcefully into the interpretation of treaties and admittedly i'm not so sure so from the perspective of the international legal order yes yeah i think uh, it, it, it is an important it is important but um I wonder whether that that then, and that is probably what the, the courts fear, that the authority of their treaty interpretation will suffer because states say, listen, I mean, you know, that's, I have nothing to do with that decision. You know, I was in the minority and, and suddenly through the back door, I'm, uh, I'm bound again. And this is typical Goethe's sorcerer apprentice phenomenon that, uh, and I, do, I have a feeling that is anyway a mindset of states that on so many levels, these international organizations invade their space, and not only as treaty makers, but also now through interpretation. Even though I have to admit, I mean, if you look at um, how, how courts deal with the issue, uh, they are pretty much concerned not to insult their customers, which are states, yeah? so, so to speak. Thanks very much, Kirsten. I think this is also a very good moment to um... To move on to uh, to the next um, to the next paper, and if there is any remaining questions, so we'll try and um, catch up um, at the end of this uh, uh, at the end of this panel. Uh, but obviously, um, this uh, university, this this school of law, is very happy uh, not only with this project but also with panels. Uh, so it's uh, it's a real pleasure to um, to uh, to give him the floor. Panels will uh, will talk about. Um, Article 313C um, of, of the Vienna Convention. And, and if I understand him correctly, we'll try and see to what extent that provision on any relevant rules of international law applicable in the relations between the parties can play a role um, to examine the, um, the, the fragmentation or to use the more neutral term these days, diversification um, of, of international law. Um, uh, perhaps coming to a sort of harmonization um, in, in this system. Uh, Panos, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing justice to your talk, so I immediately give, your, give you the floor. I managed to unmute myself, so you can see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Ramses. Although I'm, I'm not sure you'll have that many good words to say after the presentation, uh, because I'm gonna be slightly critical of the EU in a couple of, of cases uh, in the approaches uh, that they uh, took. Not too much though. Um, so uh, perhaps um, my title is a little bit of false advertising, so I'm not gonna go into the whole discussion about the, uh, the principle of systemic integration, uh, but the idea was uh, to uh, briefly outline what Article 313C is all about, although Irina and Kirsten have already uh, kind of uh, dealt with this uh, already, so I'll go very quickly. Um, and then examine a little bit the, the discussion about parties and relevant, which was uh, the most controversial and is the most controversial aspect, uh, at least for the time being, with respect to 313C. And then discuss a little bit, and this ties, I think, uh, very well with the last few questions uh, that 
Kirsten uh, got uh, regarding the connection of 313C with potentially other rules, including Articles 31, 32, or potentially other uh, canons uh, of uh, interpretation. And then if we have the time, just very briefly, to tie with the next panel uh, to discuss that maybe the principle of systemic integration has something to do with interpretation of customary international law, but very briefly on that one. So having said that, um, <clears throat> Article 313C, I've, I've, uh, I've put on the slides the, the text. You've heard it already quite a few times. They shall be taken into account together with the context any relevant rules of international law applicable in the relations between the parties. And I usually uh, joke around uh, when I teach this in, in class that pretty much every word is, is debated. So relevant, what do you mean by relevant? What do you mean by rules? What do you mean by applicable? What do you mean by parties? But the funny thing, and this also ties with what uh, Professor Ruiz Fabri said, um, what is debatable is not only what is in the text, but actually some things that were left out of the text. So originally the provision had at the end, between the parties, and then they were discussing whether to say at the time of the conclusion of the treaty or at the time of the interpretation of the treaty. So the reason why basically they left this out um, was not because they didn't want to include it, but um, because originally in uh, the uh, drafts uh, that the RLC had uh, prepared, originally there was an article on intertemporal law, specifically on intertemporal law. Um, then that uh, did not survive uh, the, uh, the negotiations, uh, the discussions. Uh, and then they decided, oh, you know what? It doesn't matter into temporal law. We don't need to have a specific article because we have uh, an article interpretation and we'll put it there. Um, and then in the end, they, they took it out from there as well because they said, well, you know what? This is a rather difficult topic to, to make a decision now. So we'll leave it uh, vague and uh, let lawyers and uh, states decide uh, for themselves. So um, eventually, uh, the, uh, the solution with respect to uh, whether um, what temporal view you would take on these relevant rules was left uh, unanswered and seems to be tied more with the volume of interpretation. Now, the term um, used, most nowadays use uh, principle of systemic integration, uh, which was uh, made uh, let's say trendy uh, by uh, McLachlan uh, with his uh, famous article, but there are other terms that have been used even earlier and are still being used. So principe d'integration, systemic interpretation, systemic harmonization, and then systematic interpretation or principle of systematic integration. To be honest, but this is a more of a pet peeve of mine, uh, systematic, I think it is linguistically wrong uh, in the sense that it refers to the way you interpret and not to the system itself, but again, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a matter of, of choice and, and preference. Um, so the, the main issue that I'm, I'm going to discuss was that, okay, with rules and uh, everything else, as, as Kirsten also said, it is a little bit debatable there, uh, what exactly, but uh, at least most courts tend to agree that you have customary international law, general principles, and uh, treaties as well. The, the part that created a lot of discussion uh, was what do we mean by parties? And um, here is, is, is why I think that you can interpret the rules of interpretation. I know I'm in the minority uh, on this, uh, but even courts and tribunals actually do engage in a process of interpretation of the rules of interpretation. So I, I paraphrased a little bit uh, an Elton John song, which says, sorry seems to be the hardest word. So instead of sorry, parties seems to be the hardest word. And of course, uh, but is it really? Um, and the case that I'm going to be using is the Vattenfall versus Germany case, the 2018 case. And the re to give you a little bit of context, this was, <coughs> sorry, this was a decision on the Ahmea issue. Um, and the idea there was that you had a decision, uh, the, the Ahmed decision where, and uh, Ramses and Kirsten, please correct me if I say something wrong on this one. I take it from the international law perspective, so feel free to correct any mistakes uh, or uh, inconsistencies that, that I might fall in. Um, so the idea was that certain bilateral investment treaties, uh, the, the idea was that bilateral investment treaties between EU parties should essentially gradually be denounced uh, in order to give uh, exclusive competence uh, to uh, the EU to uh, settle the disputes. Now, this, the Ahmer case dealt with a bilateral investment treaty. The issue was that um, 
the EU and the Commission basically wanted to expand that to include also multilateral treaties. And the Vattenfall versus Germany case was where uh, one where the Energy Charter Treaty was uh, in question. So the EU also presented certain uh, documents and certain views on, on the matter and suggested that EU law uh, potentially should be considered as a relevant rule uh, in this particular dispute. Now, the interesting thing is that <laughs> the tribunal here uh, in paragraphs 151 and 165, takes the time to go through Article 313C and basically uh, detail why we should understand it essentially as uh, referring as parties to the treaty. So the, the two interpretations of 313C is one, parties to the treaty. So all the treaties of the treaty you're interpreting, let's say Treaty 1, need to be parties to the treaty that you want to refer to for the purposes of Article 313C, so Treaty 2. Um, if you do that, then in the case of the multilateral, in case of multilateral treaties, then this becomes a little bit problematic because you need to ensure that all the parties of one treaty are also parties to the, to the other treaty. The other uh, version, and of course, uh, this is more of a spectrum rather than two uh, different approaches, is a more relaxed version where you interpret it as parties to the dispute. So you take into account uh, treaties where the two parties of, of, of the dispute are parties uh, to. Now, the tribunal in Vatafal versus Germany uh, went for the, the first one, so parties to the treaty, so the more restrictive uh, understanding of 31 3 c um, And they did that, and by referring to what they considered should be the object and purpose of interpretation and of 31 3 c The critical point here is that... Um, that the terms of the treaty must have a single consistent meaning. That's a, the first point that they're trying to make. Now, of course, one could argue, well, that's not necessarily uh, true because we can see with, the, uh, with reservations that you might have different versions of a treaty. But again, if you take it in the context of interpretation, it can make sense depending on what they mean, single consistent meaning. Uh, single consistent meaning now, throughout the entirety of time, what exactly? Um, then, they say that the need for coherence and for a single unified interpretation is reflected in the priority given to the text of the treaty itself over other contextual elements under Article 31 BCLT. Respective of whether you go for that the text has some priority or not, the LC, at least in its commentary, said that this is more of a holistic exercise, so you can debate this particular thing. Um, but the critical element is that they basically said, if we follow what the EU is saying, um, this would not ensure systemic coherence, and rather it's exact opposite, that essentially if you allowed for such a broad understanding of 313C, you would end up with so conflicting interpretations and so on that it will break the system apart. And this sounds very reasonable. It, it is a very reasonable uh, thing to say. Um, and if you could prove it, then you could potentially have an argument that this is this may be the correct way to see 313C. But if you break it down a little bit, you'll see that this claim about systemic coherence and that uh, the EU's approach uh, would render the system essentially very fragmented does not stand up to scrutiny. Before I, I continue with this, one interesting thing that has to be noted is also the political context of, of this judgment, one, one has to say. Uh, this was more of a pushback of <clears throat> the uh, dispute settlement uh, procedures established under the ECT against giving priority to the EU uh, system. So it was to be expected that they would not, uh, especially given this, this attempt to expand the Ahmer uh, judgment, that they would not yield uh, so easily. What to me is a little bit bizarre in this structure is they spent at least 15 paragraphs describing this trying to interpret, basically, because essentially what they're doing here is they're referring to the rationale, to the object and purpose of interpretation of 313C, and also uh, this last part on systemic coherence is, is more kind of a, uh, an argumentum ad absurdum or an effective interpretation uh, approach to 313C. The interesting thing is that after they've gone through all that trouble, they also spend one paragraph saying, well, at the end of the day, there's also no rule because EU did not uh, mention any rule at all which seems a little bit bizarre, at least from a methodological point of view, 
the first thing that you would argue is whether there is a rule or not, not whether it is applicable between the parties or not. The first thing that you look is whether there is a rule. And I think the reason why they went this bizarre different way was uh, due to the particular context of this dispute. But let's come back to uh, essentially uh, whether uh, this last argument stands up to scrutiny. So bear with me because I, uh, there are a number of diagrams, but the, I, that was the only way that I could make uh, sense out of this. So the control scenario, okay? So what the, the tribunal is saying that if we have one treaty, treaty one, which we're interpreting, and we have parties A, B, C, and D in that, then in order to use 431.3c another treaty, treaty two, you need to have the same parties. So if treaty two also has the same parties, then treaty two may fall under 31.3c. However, <coughs> sorry, this is, they do that also on the basis that this ensures a consistent, coherent, unified interpretation. But that is not entirely accurate because let's say you have the, this, this uh, scenario, but then state X joins treaty one at any point and it does not join treaty two. Now, you are in a scenario where you have more parties to Treaty 1 rather than Treaty 2. So in this case, Treaty 2 now, whereas previously it did not, uh, it fell under 313C, now it is outside 313C. So just by one party joining Treaty 1, automatically Treaty 2 is rendered inapplicable, not inapplicable, irrelevant for the purposes of 313C. A further scenario, let's say you have Treaty 1, which has A, B, C, D, and X parties, and Treaty 2 that has parties A, B, C, and D. Based on this, Treaty 2 does not fall under 313C. However, if a state X leaves or denounces Treaty 1 and does not join Treaty 2, then automatically Treaty 2 automatically is back to being to falling under 313C. So what I'm trying to show here, and I can give you also further examples. So any change potential change to the membership in Treaty 1 automatically may make treaties relevant or irrelevant under 313C if you follow the interpretation of the tribunal. Scenario three, the same thing actually applies if membership changes with respect to Treaty 2. So if state X joins, then the Treaty, uh, treaty 2, which did not fall under 313C, now becomes relevant under 313C. And the final scenario, the actual opposite, where they all have the same ones and state X leaves, now the treaty becomes irrelevant. So it's not just change in membership in the treaty you're interpreting, but also any kind of change of membership in the treaty that you want to refer to by virtue of 313C that actually may change whether uh, a treaty is relevant under 313C or not. So you can see that this argument about stability and coherence and unified interpretation is actually very wobbly if you take the very, very uh, restrictive approach of parties to the treaty, rather than the opposite that the uh, tribunal is arguing. So essentially, you can see I've, I've used colors to show when something was uh, permitted and then shifted to, to not permitted. And the interesting thing is that this scenario, which is according to the Vartenfall Tribunal, is claimed to be more stable, um, actually is less stable than going for parties to the dispute. And the reason is, and I've used the same kind of uh, scenario here, is because with the wider scenario, you're not only looking at parties to the dispute or parties to the treaty. You have that as kind of like a cutoff zone, but then you go again and look whether the particular treaty is relevant. That's where the crucial element happens. So in actuality, it seems that the parties to the dispute interpretation actually ensures greater stability, or at least the same stability as the parties uh, to the treaty. And so, the Vattenfall Tribunal kind of gives the impression that if we use parties to, uh, if we don't use parties, the parties to the treaty interpretation, it's uh, the, the humanity, it's going to be a disaster, everything is going to be, you're going to have different interpretations every single uh, case. 
But that is not really correct. In reality, it seems that the parties to the treaty is more like a house of cards, uh, whereas the parties to the dispute seems to be a little bit more relevant. But even if you don't uh, accept this, um, and this brings me to, to the connection of 313C uh, with, uh, with other rules. Um, so let's say you have treaties falling under 313C and you come to the conclusion that a treaty does not fall under 313C. Does this render it immediately irrelevant for interpretative purposes? And this is something that usually is not discussed in judgments and also is not argued by the parties so uh, forcefully, because the, usually in the Vattenfall case, that, that was the issue, that um, it's, it's not relevant, therefore I'm not going to discuss it more. However, you could potentially make an argument, and, and Kirsten also uh, alluded to, to this as well, that maybe it has relevance for interpreter, interpretative purposes under Article 32 of the VCLT. Uh, but that, for that, most likely, and I don't think the courts themselves would go into, into such a discussion, um, you would need the parties to argue that way. You can find uh, some uh, discussion on this uh, in the Whaling case, uh, which was mentioned in, in a question uh, that was posed to, to, to Kirsten as well. Um, Whereas the court focused a lot on, on the voting record, there, there were a couple of judges, uh, Judge Greenwood and Judge Ad Hoc uh, Charles Wolf. Charles Wolf uh, made it a little bit more explicit, um, where they argued that even though they do not fall under, sub in that case, it was about subsequent uh, agreements and practice. Um, they said, nonetheless, despite the fact that they were not adopted by consensus, nonetheless, they may be relevant for interpretative purposes, kind of hinting at the, at the possibility that this material may be uh, useful under Article uh, 32. Um, so to me, it seems that simply saying, uh, simply using a very technical uh, test and using parties to the treaty as a cutoff um, does not completely uh, engage with a discussion on whether indeed the treaty is relevant uh, or not. Um, I think I have, how many minutes more do I have, Ramses? Am I done? I'm done. Can I have one more minute? Okay, so uh, the final thing that, that I would like to mention also is the, the connection also with uh, empire materia. Now, this is, well, depending on the author that you will ask, uh, it might be a canon a rule, uh, a customary rule, uh, whatever. Um, but depending on how you see empire materia interpretation, whether it refers to treaties of the same subject matter or similar subject uh, matter, uh, there might be some connections also with Article 313C. Uh, uh, um, and this is quite interesting, especially uh, because empire materia also kind of uh, nobody knows where to categorize it, um, whether it's an ordinary meaning, whether it is part under Article 313C or not. And it seems that it also was raised recently in the Qatar versus United Arab uh, Emirates uh, case, where it seems that an in, a kind of empire material interpretation was referred to by the parties, but the court did not go too much uh, in depth uh, there. So there's still uh, ways to see how this particular uh, canon is connected to Article 313C. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Panos. And sorry to have to rush you, but it's. Yeah. Um, we're already in, um, in, in, uh, in the break, actually, uh, but I, I'm, I'm looking at also at, at, at the two of you and including uh, Soterios to see if we can have a few more minutes uh, of the coffee break to, um, to have a discussion um, on some of the questions. So please feel free to, um, to mention them in the Q&A box. Um, also looking in the meantime to the fellow panelists or future panelists that may have questions um, on this issue. We can have five or 10 minutes, that is good. Uh, Elaine, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, very quickly, there are no uh, other questions. Um, I, I mean, I, I think Panos knows everything that can be known about uh, Article 31 3C. So I think this is what also why people shy away from, uh, from questions. Uh, at the same time, I've wondered many times whether this article, uh, which was for a long time considered as a sleeping beauty, 
uh, did not become quite a monster when awakened and uh, became a monster precisely due to all these uh, difficulties uh, in interpretation. So you show very accurately that they can be uh, overcome, but uh, nevertheless, uh, you can see that uh, not all adjudicatory bodies uh, take the same uh, precautions when interpreting. And uh, uh, whereas the European Court of Human Rights is very easy in not checking anything in relation to that, just using Article 31.3c without uh, trying to check whether there are parties uh, to the same treaty or the treaty, whatever, they are rid of these uh, technicalities, maybe that's the right way to do things. Other ones uh, dig into the details like at the WTO and it is there you can see, uh, you can meet a kind of, of nightmare. But precisely this is what happened at the WTO, this paradox that the more universal a treaty is, uh, the more it is at risk that 313C cannot function. And so this is what happened in the case regarding the, the uh, the Convention on Climate Change, uh, because you had this difference in, in one party, as you see. And so uh, I was just wondering uh, whether it, it, it was uh, um, in, in line with what you, you said. Sorry, I was interrupted, of course, the moment when my daughter tries to call me on FaceTime. So, <laughs> so I don't know whether what I say makes sense for you. Okay, thank you, Ellen. No, uh, exactly. It, it it makes it makes absolute sense, and and this is why I said that the um, the idea is about uh, about a spectrum kind of kind of approach to thirty one three C because it seems a little bit too artificial to to uh, for one party to to kind of say this is this is absolutely not relevant unless again but, but again there we we go into a discussion of whether it is relevant indeed uh, or not and I think a, a lot of the authors have argued uh, on this basis. You can see that this also is the, the under, not the understanding, but the, the approach also that the ILC uh, went for, because also in the, in the previous ones on subsequent agreements, and more importantly, subsequent practice, they, they kind of refer to, well, uh, practice that reflects the common intention of the parties. And the, the ILC, when they, with Nolte as special rapporteur, when they were discussing this, they said, well, well, you don't need to have explicit practice. Even their silence uh, can be enough uh, to, to consider it uh, as, as sufficient under falling under 313B. So a similar argument could be made there that just because one state has not uh, ratified a particular treaty, nonetheless, uh, at least for a particular provision, uh, its silence may not uh, render that uh, treaty irrelevant for the purpose of 313C. The, you're absolutely correct. The European Court of Human Rights really doesn't care. Um, <laughs> same thing with the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, but they deal, you know, they, they focus more on the, on the corpus juris humanis uh, kind of thing. The European Court of Human Rights also has the Council of Europe. So basically they, they bring every Council of Europe treaty irrespective of whether it's one, two, three, I don't know how many parties uh, not uh, relevant. Which again, um, could be an argument, uh, I mean, you could potentially uh, make an argument if, if you want to go there, uh, that uh, there is a possibility of, of uh, having specialized rules of interpretation uh, depending on, on the tribunal. And there you go back to the interpretive communities uh, kind, uh, kind of argument, which is not bad, as we said, not fragmentation, diversification in this particular case. Yeah, you can even think about because you had all this uh, semantic differences that you pointed out. And you can also refer to, to a very fashionable concept that is uh, much and much more used now, which is intersectionality. And you can wonder whether also it can, uh, Article 31 3C couldn't be used under this angle. Just uh, an idea following all, all your explanations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. A, a few questions come in. Let me just squeeze in one uh, that I wrote down, um, which is related to some of the things you mentioned. But you started off with all the elements of, of, of 313C are disputed or could be disputed. Uh, but but you, you did, if I remember well, you did not mention international law as such, right, as, as something. So the, the question that comes up also uh, when you discuss Armea and, 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 and the Vattenfall case um, is to what extent indeed what happens if this is not um, international law that is uh, valid between the parties? And of course, it would raise questions in relation to, to external third parties. But if we're just having a, a small club of, let's say, EU states uh, um, having other EU rules, uh, 
to what extent would that be uh, would that fit in and this may actually fit in well as well with the with the question that andre de hoog uh, just raised that comes in let me see even if one were to use parties of the disputes uh on which i'm not convinced in the situation of what involved this would then only allow recourse to a 33 cc for bilateral investment treaties among eu members but not for brts with external uh parties it's a related uh, in a way a sort of related question uh in indeed uh, um with, with respect to that, because the treaty being interpreted was the Energy Charter Treaty, which which has parties both EU and non-EU, yeah. it would depend on the on the parties. It would also depend on uh, also um, on, on on how far you want to go, actually, uh, because during the negotiations of, of the VCLC, uh, the actual Vienna Conference, not the ILC, um, there was an amendment proposed where basically the, the argument was that 313C should be uh, any relevant rules applicable uh, in, in the relations between any one of the parties, uh, actually. So they wanted to make it e even uh, broader. Uh, but what I would say to, to Andrea, if there all the conditions uh, that uh, he suggests are, are met. Uh, so if it was uh, a, a treaty being interpreted only between the EU members and uh, then how you would uh, refer to it, um, then it would depend on the, on the particular parties. The BITs, yes, uh, that would be uh, the case. If you had external members, then the question would be who were the parties to the BIT? So would it be an EU member state or a non uh, or two non EU member states? So is it one of the parties or none of the parties? And then again, even in that case, you might have reference to Article 32 because the investment tribunals also uh, have been quite fond of you know throwing uh, all sorts of BITs where none of the parties uh, are uh, you know uh, common with the parties or the BIT they are interpreting just to make that uh, the argument that you know this is the common approach this is accepted by everybody and stuff like and stuff like that. Okay. Thank you very much, Panos. There's a number of other questions uh, are coming in, but I, I, I urge you to take a look at them and perhaps answer them um, yeah. at, at a certain moment or we pick them up at the end, because I think uh, everyone deserves a coffee break uh, at this moment. And I'm, I'm very happy to see that uh, Professor Fortini Pazazzi is already has already joined us. Hi, Faye. Good to see you, um, because you will be chairing the, um, the next panel, uh, in, uh, which starts in 15 minutes.